uh, assalamu alaikum uh, my name is kiran amir and i am the director of operations at parsa eco pakistan super hub i would like to welcome you all to the first eco session in series of hepatology eco it's in collaboration with pakistan society of hepatology and we are thankful to ferocens laboratories limited for unrestricted educational grant our expert for tonight is dr shahid habib before dr daud gilzai introduces our expert and topic for tonight session we have to go through some standard announcements we are part of a global movement called project echo based in usa with an objective to disseminate knowledge and best practices we do protect patient privacy so none of the information used in this session will identify any individual or patient for maintaining discipline you all are muted but we do encourage participation so you can unmute yourself for questions and use the raise hand option or chat box by participating you have given the consent for recording and the recorded session will be available on our youtube channel link will be shared by haris in chat box by uh, for cme credits please contact to zair our coordinator his number is mentioned on the banner cme credits are affiliated with jinnah sin medical university for the convenience of folks the session is bilingual please speak in urdu english whatever language you are comfortable in i will now hand over to dr daud kulzai who is the moderator for tonight's session Dr. Daud. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the Dr. Uh, Shahid Abib, he is uh, an uh, international advisory member of Pakistan Society of Hepatology, and uh, he uh, is awarded as a Distinguished Academic Services Award from uh, Pakistan Society of Hepatology. he is a consultant gastroenterologist and a pathologist south arizona veterans affairs health care system uh, tucson uh, arizona usa he has particular interest and in numerous publication on management of chronic liver disease liver transplant drug induced liver failure hcc and its surveillance and nfld he has been awarded with certificate of excellence by university of colorado pakistan society of gastroenterology and certificate of merit by american college of physician today he will talk on understanding the pathophysiology of metabolic syndrome with emphasis on nutrition as a key player in causation and treatment of nash dr shahid abib over to you uh, thank you bahut shukriya uh, thank you for the invitation it's really a uh, very uh, honorable uh, invitation and i'm very obliged uh, and and i'm very honored to be part of this society and in this educational program do you guys hear me yes we can hear you uh um, can you speak a little bit louder or come closer to the mic we are uh, just that it is less audible we can hear you but it is less audible okay uh thank you very much for inviting me uh for this invitation uh, for this uh, conference it's really uh, honored to be part of the society so just uh, without losing much time and i'm going to start with my presentation uh now i'm going to be share the screen do you see my screen yes okay so we're talking about the pathophysiology of fatty liver disease that is a in itself is a very complex topic and it's very challenging so i'm going to go with the uh, what the basic concept was 20 years ago or 30 years ago and what the concept we have as a key phenomena of the pathophysiology so in 2025 years ago we thought that there's only two hit pathogenesis meaning that insulin resistance leads to triglyceride deposition in the liver causing steatosis 
and subsequently causing the reactive oxide species, oxidative stress, causing inflammation and fibrosis and the cancer. So this concept has been modified over time. And now it say that basically there's a multiple etiopathogenic factors act in parallel or sequential to somehow synergistic way on a genetically predisposed individual to cause nephrod and thus defining the spectrum of the disease phenotype. Particularly some patients will develop nephrod just in non-alcoholic fatty liver and consequently NASH. But others will directly present inflammation, fibrosis without having significant fat in the liver. So this concept is very different than what we had before. So there's, that's one thing I would like to definitely share that. So this is kind of a, uh, the paradigm, how we learn about the NASH. So it was not a positive direction from learning from the social behavior to the disease. Instead, we, come, we encountered a lot of end-stage NASH patients dying in the past decade. And that led us to study more about uh, uh, the pathophysiology of NAF, NASH, NAFLD and NASH. As you see in this uh, uh, box here, so the obesity or steatosis plus minus genes lead in adipose tissue or the visceral tissue lead to metabolic dysregulation. First starting at the insulin resistance and then affecting adipokines and nuclear receptors. So this is the key uh, pathogenetic factors. And certainly the, it starts from overeating behavior and that led to the obesity. The different phenotypes of nephil. People can have a fat all over the body. As you can see here, this phenotype, like this phenotype, or you just have the fat in the stomach area, belly fat, or truncal obesity. So the skin fold thickness in the abdomen is a good, good measure of fatty liver disease. It's a very strongly associated for the diagnosis of nephilim, at least. And the people can have the low BMI can also have the nephilim and the NASH. So there's a huge variation in the phenotype of fatty liver disease. So before we talked about the uh, fatty liver, I just wanted to talk a little bit briefly about the biology of the nutrition. So the nutrition biology starts from the shop, the grocery shopping, cooking, how we eat, digestion, absorption. So the nutrition starting from the, we buy the food, it goes through the several steps of processing, cooking, ingestions, digestion, absorption, porter circulation, metabolic reprocessing and recycling in the liver, transport of the nutrients to the circulation, into the systemic circulation, and finally, reaching to the end organ, such as muscles, bones, endocrine gland, skin, hormone, et cetera, and et cetera, where these nutrients are utilized. So there's a huge, it's a long process buying from the store to the utilization in our, uh, in our tissues. So this, so when we do that, when we have, the, when we eat food, as I mentioned that it goes to the different stages of the processing. As I mentioned on this slide here, is a digestion, transport, and the transport could be intraluminal transport, transport across the cellular membranes of the intestine. It could be the transport across the portal circulation, the transport across the hepatocyte cell membrane, the transport into the cells, and then further transport into the systemic circulation. So when we things go that every step is actually is independent biologic process. So as you can see that wherever you are, which step of the processing of the nutrition, it involves certain chemicals, whether this is an enzyme or transport proteins or are different 
uh, modulation of the nutrients from oxidation, hydrolysis, or kind of a other steps. So it changes, it goes through the multiple steps of biologic process. So there are a lot of biologic process going on. And finally, it goes to the utilized in the end organ tissue. These enzymes, the biologic process at any given stage of the process is controlled by the, some of the hormones, GI hormones and the GI secretions. And these secretions are the gatekeeper of the biologic processes. And these genes are regulated by our genes. And these mediators are regulated by our neurohormonal system. And the neurohormonal system could be the systemic neurohormonal system or the local paracrine system of neurohormonal secretion. So it is controlled by the genes. So the mediators are the key factor that process the food, that control, they are the gatekeeper. If anything happens to these secretions or enzymes, either upregulated or downregulated, they interfere with the whole process, biologic process of the nutrition. And the genes certainly play a background role into that. Uh, in this whole biologic process, insulin has the key role. That's the only hormone, which is the anabolic hormone and the other hormones such as the serum cortisol and other hormone, and uh, other than the growth hormone, they are catabolic. So the insulin hormone has a big time role in the processing of the food. That include the processing as far as into the utilization process, as well as into the processing into hepatocytes. So that has a big time role. So the biggest function of the insulin hormone is to transport glucose into the cell. And also when it gets into the cell, it, it regulate multiple function inside the cell. And it really does not matter what cell is that, whether this cell is the hepatocytes or adipose tissue or it's a muscle cell. It controls multiple functions. But yes, there is a variability in the intracellular function depending upon the tissue, whether this is adipocyte, hepatocytes, or the muscle. And these are the three tissues which are hormone sensitive, like insulin hormone sensitive. So on this side here, you see the insulin hormone, insulin receptor, and this is p uh, phoso inositol 3 kinase enzyme here. So this is the main. And this lead to AKT signaling. And this AKT signaling affects the mTOR inflammatory process, glycogen synthesis, and other metabolic functions and the cell growth. This cycle, which I'm showing here, is basically controlled cellular growth. So in nutshell, what I'm saying is that is a, uh, Insulin hormone is a key hormone that controls all the intracellular metabolic functions and also the regeneration or the growth of any individual tissue cell. For example, it could be, uh, it could be colon, it could be any other organs too. And the insulin hormone is secreted. There is a, when we eat food, the, the, the amount of glucose getting into the systemic circulation, it, it's very important. Amount and the duration. How quickly the blood glucose rise is the, is the key factor. If it is rising very instantaneously, like eating high glycemic food, has a delay in the secretion of the insulin because it is not secreted by the GLP. The GLP in creatinine hormone is the key hormone that regulate the insulin secretions. And the GLP not only causing the insulin secretion, but also affects the other organ or utilization of the uh, nutrients. So it has a dual function. So for example, when we eat foods such as the juices, which are instantaneously absorbed in the mouth, lead to hyperglycemia within few seconds. 
So that instantaneous hyperglycemia does not affect the incretin hormone secretion because the incretin is secreted by the small bowel and it's also secreted and it functions in the portal circulation where it is deactivated and it is released very short, short term and it's deactivated by the DDP4 enzymes. So it's a very short term release leading to the affecting that in the beta cells that is shown here, the pathways, and that causes the insulin regime. So when you eat high glycemic food, the insulin is secreted, the blood glucose get high first, and it does, it, there's a delay in the stimulation of the beta hormones, the beta islet cells in the pancreas. And that insulin secretion is directly stimulated by the glucose, not by the incretin hormones. When we eat fruit, for example, or some food, which takes time to be get digested and it releases the glucose slowly, that where the incretin hormone gets stimulated and that's where it's a more stable utilization of the glucose. And then you have additional effect of incretin hormones in the metabolic system. So the action of the glucose are mediated by the insulin receptor one and insulin receptor two. And now again, I wanted to highlight two things here. So insulin receptor one, there are two different receptors. The insulin receptor one functions when we eat food, the postprandial processing of utilization of the food, glucose. The insulin receptor two functions when we are in the fasting state. So both are independent processes. So when the both are independent processes, they change the intracellular mechanism of the insulin. So when we are in the fasting state, the, the function of the insulin actually stimulate the lipolysis and utilization of the fat to be used as an energy in the muscle cells. So the function changes dramatically, intracellular function changes dramatically, whether we are in the postprandial state or in the fasting state. So there are two separate mechanisms, both works by the insulin hormone. So what is the insulin resistance? How do we define the insulin resistance? Insulin resistance is the time, how quickly we dispose of the blood glucose into muscles and the fat tissue. So the time needed to dispose the blood glucose in a fixed dose manner. So the slow rate of disposition of the blood glucose in by the insulin hormone to muscle and fat tissue is called insulin resistance. So it needs more insulin or more time to dispose of the certain amount of the fixed amount of the blood glucose levels. So that's where it leads to abnormal transformation of the carbohydrate sugar into the fat. So when we eat food and somebody has an insulin resistance, so it means either it's gonna take long. And second thing is that it requires more insulin. And because the blood glucose rises very quickly, like 300, 400 range, it is a flood. It's an emergency situation, is a, is a code blue. So the body says that, okay, store this sugar regardless what the, whatever the manner is. So this liver stored, all the sugar is converted into fat and that is called de novo lipogenesis, which I'm gonna discuss in a minute. Or the fat is stored or the sugar is, and sugar is converted into the fat by the endothelial cells and it is stored as fat. So the endothelial cells perform the same function as the liver cells to convert the sugar into the fat. And that's where the atherosclerosis happens. So both insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance are measured as a metabolic clearance of glucose by, given, by a given amount of insulin. Insulin sensitivity and resistance are alternative ways to represent the ability of insulin to clear glucose. As the metabolic clearance of glucose is measured along a continuous scale, the degree of insulin sensitivity versus resistance varies continuously along a sliding scale for a given individual. So, so whole phenomenon of the insulin resistance is basically, it's a scale. Metabolic syndrome, what we classify as, and I'll talk in a minute, metabolic syndrome. So the, it is measured by the HOMA score, which we commonly use in our clinical practice. It's available over the, uh, in the web. You can just uh, do that. So is there a single point of metabolic malfunction to explain insulin resistance? No, there's no single point problem where you can say, hey, this is the problem. This is the insulin resistance. There is no such things. 
So pathogenesis of insulin resistance is multifactorial. There are multiple abnormalities are happening at the same time in any given individual. And that makes the complexity. So when on the scale of insulin resistance, when we see the certain parameters clinically, for example, high triglyceride, high blood glucose, uh, high tranquil obesity, coagulation defects, and type 2 diabetes, or high blood pressure, we call is a metabolic syndrome. But that stage is far beyond the initiation of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance probably started several years before the patient become or develop metabolic syndrome. So there's a huge gap identifying metabolic syndrome or the initiation of the problem probably 10 years ago, uh, starting with a simple insulin resistance. So the biggest challenge in understanding the pathophysiology is the, how the fat accumulate into the liver and then the fat turn into inflammation and the scarring fibrosis. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, all three of them. Uh, the steatosis is the reflecting, reflection, reflecting underlying metabolic derangement with or without insulin resistance. And it marks the beginning of metabolic syndrome, NASH, atherosclerosis, and malignancy. So in particular, so the steatosis is not just the beginning of the NASH. It is the beginning of the metabolic syndrome lead to steatosis and steatosis is the marker of many systemic problem. That includes coronary artery disease, strokes, uh, blood clots, and many others. And on above and beyond, it was also tied with malignancy as I shown in the previous slide that so insulin hormone control your cellular growth function. So when the fat deposit happens, so it is considered, so there are two types of the fat deposits. It's called normal adipose tissue fat, and the second is ectopic fat. So the ectopic fat is fat which is not stored into the adipose tissue. Normal adipose tissue is located underneath the skin. And the ectopic fat is any, any fat deposits other than the adipose tissue, such as in blood vessels, endothelium, liver, kidney, pancreas, anywhere it is that. So in the liver, fat content less than 5% is normal and fat content greater than 33% is considered abnormal. And, and in between, there's a range between 5% and 33% is kind of an indeterminate fat, but yes, it's a, a fat deposit. So the etiology of uh, uh, what causes the insulin resistance? The insulin resistance happens due to multiple factors. It is the above and beyond, the number one cause of insulin resistance is unhealthy lifestyle. And certainly the stress and sleeplessness along with the including into the unhealthy lifestyle is a major factor. Alcohol, medication, hepatitis C, thyroid dysfunction, metal storage disease, starvation, hereditary disorders, other metabolic diseases, all causes insulin resistance. And certainly aging in itself causes insulin resistance. There's a gender predisposition, there's a racial predisposition, and there are many more polymorphism, genetic polymorphism of multiple enzymes act on the background to predispose the individuals who have unhealthy lifestyle leading to fatty liver disease and NASH. And that explains why every, not every individual having unhealthy food develop fatty liver. So there are some people who are living unhealthy, having unhealthy lifestyle, they live longer and they do not have any medical problem because probably they do not have the genetic predisposition. So lifestyle and insulin resistance and steatosis. So I'm not going into the detail of much, but I'm just giving you the key, key factors, the key, uh, the key notes of that. So the impaired lifestyle, meaning excessive calories and the un unhealthy ingredients of the food and lack of sleep, stresses, and the timing of the food makes a huge difference in the regulation of the food or biology of the nutrition and that causes the insulin resistance. So there are a few points, uh, key points I want to highlight that the, how the food and the nutrition has an impact on insulin resistance. So the first thing is, the first question is that can excess calories diet, regardless of its composition, lead to steatosis? 
yes, it leads to both insulin resistance. If anybody, any person is eating more than the calories required, definitely it's gonna go to insulin resistance and steatosis. Number two, can isocalic, isocalic means that you are consuming the calories what your body needs that. For example, 1500, 16, and whatever your, the basal energy expenditure is, you are consuming the same amount of calories with modulation. For example, if somebody eating 1500 calories, but high fat diet, such as a keto diet or high carbohydrate diet, like 90% carbohydrate versus 10% uh, fat and protein or the isocaloric diet, but with the, with the saturated fat, high content of the butter, margarine, are the meat fat and isocaloric balanced diet with the high glycemic are patient having a, uh, like high glycemic is a balanced, but still having high glycemic food, like you're drinking juices, soda, can you start? Yes. So this, the type, the modulation also make a huge difference. Then a hypercaloric balanced diet, like you eating like 2000 calories instead of 1500, but they are balanced in terms of the distribution, the fat, protein, and the uh, carbohydrate contents. Yes, it can lead to steatosis. Can normal isocalic balanced diet with healthy ingredient composition can lead to, even though the diet is fully healthy, but patient can still develop insulin resistance if because of the other factors in the lifestyle. The timing of the food is very important. Life stress, like stress releases the cortisol level, growth hormone level, and other, other hormones. Sleep circadian cycle has an important impact. Medication, what we use for other reasons. There are many medications we use every day. They are obesogenic and dysregulate the metabolic system. And certainly the genetic background can also make it possible to happen. So what are the other factors? Can aging independent of the dietary calories and modulation lead to steatosis? Yes, there is a significant evidence that the aging is, a, is associated with steatosis and insulin resistance. And that's why it is a part of the FIB4 calculation and other factors. What is the relationship between the insulin resistance and steatosis? It's a bi-directional, meaning the, the insulin resistance causes steatosis and steatosis causes insulin resistance and they act as synergistically, not just an additive effect. What is the relationship between the insulin resistance and hepatic fibrosis? Again, it's a bi-directional. There's a sufficient evidence to support that the insulin resistance lead to hepatic fibrosis and the hepatic fibrosis causes insulin resistance. So pretty much all cirrhotic patients will have insulin resistance until proved otherwise. So because of the advanced degree of the fibrosis and dysregulation. So in just kind of a little summarizing that, so environmental epigenetic and genetic factors work as a, a background. It leads to insulin resistance. And then the food we eat is converted into leading to de novo lipogenesis, decreased. So the, when we say the metabolic, uh, the lipid or metabolic homeostasis, so it causes a, uh, the decreased excretion and increased lipogenesis, de novo lipogenesis. The de novo lipogenesis is happening because of the, uh, because of the, the conversion of uh, sugar into the fat. And then eventually the steatosis, which lead to both orthotopic means the adipose tissue and ectopic means like in the other than the adipose tissues fat. So what are, how the energy met metabolic system work? So energy metabolic system involves multiple organs, intestine, liver, as adipose tissue, pancreas as muscle. The intertissue signaling, all these uh, organs, they connect, they talk with each other by means of incretins, which is the GLP hormones, uh, insulin hormones, adipokines, which is released by the uh, adipose tissue and other hormones such as catecholamines, sex hormones, growth hormones, and glucagon. How they mediate that? There's a hunger satiety cycle, which is nervous system and hormones such as leptin and uh, leptin hormone, and the tissue specific uh, receptor and signaling uh, uh, pathways. So that, as I mentioned that the insulin hormone play a key role 
and that where the insulin control the intracellular uh, metabolic functions of the liver, uh, muscles, and other tissues. And then certainly there is a transport protein and enzymes, and then the bile acid and microbiota, uh, microbiota play a key role in the uh, mediation of the uh, uh, mediation of the energy metabolic system or the biology of the uh, nutrition. So this is the, uh, showing the, the, uh, uh, this cartoon actually showing how the fat homeostasis works. So basically when we eat uh, food here, this is in the blood circulation here, this is a hepatocytes. So as you see that the fat coming from the free fatty acid, this is the blood food coming from the uh, intestine from here. And by means of that, so dietary fat, like 15% of the fat is converted into the de novo lipogenesis. So the 25% of the intracellular fat comes from that. And that fat is coming from the adipose tissue in the state of fasting when the adipose tissue releases the fatty acids, it go to the circulation and whatever the, circulate, the fatty acid, which is not utilized, it just goes to here. And it's peroxisome here, it's converted used here and then it's the free fatty acids and then mitochondrial oxidation. And then the second step is the uh, uh, excretion of the fat through the, especially the steroid and other uh, fat excretion into the bile and the excess fat is uh, excreted. The other mechanism of loss of fat is by means of burning. The burning means the fat is being used as energy in the muscle and other tissues. And the second is that the excess fat is also converted into brown fat, which is thermogenesis, meaning that it burned to waste the excessive amount of fat. So there should be a balance between the intake influx and the outflux. Outflux means the waste utilization and the wastage of the excessive amount of fat. So whenever there's an imbalance between the influx and the outflux, there is a fatty liver. So this is the another part of the uh, uh, fat homeostasis is the uh, adipose tissue. So the, or, there is a hormone sensitive lipase and this is the adipose tissue. And then there's an excessive amount of fat. It leads to production of the two hormones like leptin and uh, adiponectin. So leptin actually is the uh, uh, appetite control system where it affects in the brain and it, uh, it leads to the stop the, the satiety factor, the satiety center in the hypothalamus. The satiety center say that, okay, the fat content, the fat tissue is full and saturated. There is no need to eat any food. However, the eating behavior is in, there are two types of eating behavior, which is called the satiety control behavior, which is controlled by the leptin. And there's a leptin independent uh, neural system, which is controlled by the prefrontal cortex. And that actually causes the, the fun eating or pleasure eating or reward eating it means that when we want to celebrate something, regardless of our fat tissue content, regardless of the leptin inhibition, we still eat, we still drink, we still do what we have to do, what we do. So that pleasure eating, the quote unquote called pleasure eating is independent of the, uh, neurohormone regulation system. And the excess fat, which is consumed during the pleasure eating is converted into fat and that kind of stays into the liver or the sugar, whatever the food we eat that. So then there's another part of the control system is the bile acids. The bile acids actually help to secrete or uh, excrete the excess Shahid, you have uh, muted yourself. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Do you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. So the bile acids are have a multiple role here. They're, certainly, we know that the, for a long time, we know that the bile acids work as a uh, me, uh, as a uh, as a mediator to digest the fat in the intestine. However, there are many more functions of the bile acid, what we learned recently. It actually not only controls the uh, digestion of the fat, but it also causes 
the function, metabolic functions of carbohydrate and fat in the hepatocytes and adipose tissue and in muscles. So it has a way longer. So when we eat food rich in fat or glucose or sugar, so when the, it stimulates the bile flow and it, it actually coordinates with the amount of the bile acids needed to help to digest and utilize eventually is controlled by the bile acid system. So that bile acids are produced or controlled by the nuclear receptors. And there is a lot of effect and dysregulation of bile acids by the dysbiosis. Now, which I'm coming to that. So it's some, this slide summarizes that the how the two different bile acid system affect the metabolic system of that, the hepatic FXR and the ileal FXR. So there are two separate FXR secretion system in the intestine and in, in the liver. The both have a separate function by functionality, but they coordinate very well to control the utilization of the ingested carbohydrates and fat. And the TGR5, basically what the bile acids lead to TGR5, this is a uh, uh, G-coupled protein receptors is activated by the bile acids and they release the incretin hormone. So the incret GLP-1 is not secreted. So it has the intermediate steps of stimulation of TGR5, which is stimulated by the bile salt. And TGR5 TGR leads to incretin hormone, GLP-1 secretion, and GLP-1 causes the insulin secretion and insulin leads to improved insulin sensitivity and utilization of carbohydrate and fat. So it's a very complex cascade of events. And then uh, certainly the, the TGR5 also causes in the muscle and adipose tissue increased burning thermogenesis and the utilization of excess, the food we eat that. So when we eat food, the body gets ready for its utilization to be disposed of, to go through the whole process. The other thing is that uh, this is kind of a show the, uh, how the, the uh, FXR system and the PPR gamma system, the PPR gamma, PPAR, PPR gamma, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, there are four types. And this is a peroxisome proliferator activator receptors. So basically peroxisome is intracellular uh, 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 organelle, which actually has the capacity to process the ingested carbohydrates to convert into fat. That is the organelle where exactly the lipogenesis happens. And every fat that comes to the, uh, from the adipose tissue is also processed in the peroxisome. And the function of peroxisome is controlled by the PPAR. And the PPAR is controlled by the genes and controlled indirectly through the nuclear receptor, PPAR, gamma receptor, PPAR receptors. So if the PPAR is not activated, so certainly the processing of the glucose and the fat will not happen normally. And at the same time, the PPAR gamma function is different in the liver as opposed to in the muscle tissue. So there is two separate systems. So the PPAR gamma affects more of muscle tissue, whereas the PPAR alpha affects more of the hepatic tissue. So there is a huge uh, difference in that. So that's why so the PPAR gamma target medications are like the Actos, which is PPAR gamma, which helps to dispose of more sugar and the fat utilized by the muscle. That what is improved the sensitivity of that. So that's why it does not cause fatty liver. It relieves the fat, it relieves the fat from the hepatic tissue and being utilized by that. And the PPAR alpha, which is kind of a, have the different effect, uh, which is kind of a, utilizes the triglycerides get off of that and it can burnt by the beta oxidation system into the cells.
and leading to decreased yield. So one way it increases excretion through the utilization by the beta oxidation system. The other kind of a use is the beta gamma, uses the more utilization, utilization of muscle tissue. So there's a new concept that the, the combination of beta and alpha drug, such as the phenofibrate and actos together, they can work better as opposed to each in the NASH and fatty liver disease. So the nuclear receptors, the so nuclear receptors are different thing. As I mentioned that is a P part, alpha, beta, gamma, and FXR, I mentioned that the FXR. So in an in accumulation, the net effect is the accumulation, how the fat happens, the fat accumulates, the steatosis happens. Whenever there's a more influx, then we eat more than what we need. And then there's impairment in the excretion or utilization of the fat by the body. So the imbalance lead to the hepatic steatosis or overall steatosis of the body. And certainly the utilization could be either impaired by the beta oxidation process or excretion into that or into the thermogen, impaired thermogenesis or burning of the fat. And above and all, so there's an impaired function of the bile salts because if the bile salts are not working, then certainly there's a, uh, the incretin effect will be lost so GLP will not be secreted and there will be more blood glucose to be, uh, to be disposed of and resulting into the abnormal fat accumulation or de novo genesis. So next step is the inflammation and fibrogenesis. So the, I, this is here the dysbiosis. So when we eat the food rich in sugar and saturated fat, like a high glycemic food and the or overeating, so it actually changes the gut microbiota. So when it changes the gut microbiota, it releases the, uh, the whole pattern is changed. When we uh, the normal microbiota is replaced by the pathogenic microbiota, so then it is, it is uh, uh, sensed by the, the, uh, the MHC class two antigen by the reticular endothelial cells as a foreign particle. And that's where the inflammative, inflammatory process starts. That's what is called PAMP, the pathogen associated molecular patterns. And that lead to the initiation of the cytokines and inflammatory process. And these inflammatory process leads to the leaky gut and that lead to the inflammatory process into the portal circulation and eventually into the liver causing the inflammatory process. So this is one way of uh, 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 the processing of inflammation. The second is the lipotoxicity effect, which when the fat get deposit, it leads to the multiple ways to cause ER stress and metabolic stress. And that leads to the beta oxidation, mitochondrial dysfunction, lysosomal dysfunction, and impaired autophagy. And all these functions lead to uh, apoptosis. So the cell death without inflammation. However, both of these, like when I, as I mentioned previously, uh, so when the steatosis happens, it's not just the fatty liver, it's the steatosis of the entire body. It's a systemic disease. So it's the pancreatic steatosis and pancreatic fibrosis leads to loss of the beta cell functions. So, and it aggravates the problem. So that's why some of the patients over the course of time become type, behave like a type one diabetic because over time the pancreas is completely gone. Beta cell function is completely gone. So now they are behaving like an insulin deficient patient. And uh, in the endothelial cells, what heart steatosis or the kidney steatosis all lead to hypertension or atherosclerotic disease. So this is a systemic disease. And again, so the, uh, this is microbiota, this is apoptosis, both lead to the Kupfer cell stimulation and the Kupfer cell stimulation lead to uh, stellate cell stimulation and the stellate cell stimulation lead to fibrogenesis. So what is the role of genes? As I mentioned in my previous slides, that the biologic process is a long process. It's a multiple steps, biological steps are happening. And imagine how many proteins are involved at each steps, how many nutrition ingredients are involved. And imagine each protein and each step is regulated by a different gene. So you're talking several hundred genes involved in the ingestions of food to the utilization. How many genes could be abnormal? So the data is so sporadic and so extensive that there's no conclusive single gene has been identified as the cause of that. Multiple genes has been isolated. 
that is associated with fibrogenesis, associated with steatosis. As you see that in this slide, so it's the genes that affect the insulin sensitivity, the genes that affect the hepatic flux and triglyceride level, the genes that affect the oxidative stress, the genes that express the endotoxins that respond, the genes just control the cytokines activity, genes that cause the fibrogenesis. So any individual can have a different variation in the gene abnormalities. So the, there are a few genes which has been highlighted and debated or kind of discussed more than the others. For example, P and PLA3, which is more kind of a, a adipo, adipocytes uh, uh, gene controlling the adiponectin and causing more steatosis, which is more prevalent in the Hispanic population than others. Uh, I, I don't know about this, the gene prevalence in our society in Pakistan and India, but probably since we are very, behave very similarly clinically uh, with a Mexican population or Hispanic population. So maybe we have that kind of a gene prevalence as well. Can genetic factors? Yes. It, genetic predisposition dictate regardless of our behavior, the progression of the disease. And that has been studied in the twin study model. So the steatosis heritability is 50% and nephil steer, uh, uh, and fibrosis heritability is 50%. So yes, there's a strong genetic predisposition factor along with our uh, behavior. So insulin resistance to fibrosis. So how the, the in summary, what are the factors causes the inflammation, apoptosis, dysbiosis, metabolic stress, and genes causes directly is inflammatory process. And similarly, apoptosis, inflammation, and genes causes the fibrogenesis. So in summary here that you can see the, the summarizes what I said that the insulin, uh, the bad food, poor glycemic with the, with the genetic predisposition, metabolic dysfunction, paroxysm, lipogenesis, reactive side oxygen, steatosis, oxidative stress, cytokines and lipids, the inflammatory process, and then steatohepatitis, and then this is controlling factor modia. The, the problem with the different lipogenesis, decreased LDL secretion, and other genetic nuclear receptor uh, malfunctioning leading to the PPAR alpha gamma dysregulation or FXR dysregulation lead to inflammatory process, and dysregulated metabolic system, and leading to steatosis and so in conclusion, what we see that because of so complexity of aging, sex, ethnicity, diet and alcohol over behavior with the background of microbiota dys dysbiosis with genetic and epigenetic factors. So they are tied, interlinked, so connected with each other. It connect. So this bonding is directly and act synergistically. Once the process start, it kind of a compounded every single day. So that's why there's a lot of heterogeneity. Lean people can develop NASH, obese people can develop NASH. And uh, every individual behave different. Some people respond to, uh, some people develop diabetes, other don't develop diabetes. Some people develop uh, 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 some features of metabolic syndrome, others don't develop that. Some people develop inflammation, other don't develop uh, inflammation. In some people, the fibrogenesis is more despite the NASH, without having NASH. Some people, the fibrogenesis is quite extensive, even though they do not have the fat and significant inflammatory process. So there's a lot of variability in the clinical practice from day to day, what we see that. And certainly each individual has a uh, different complex, different uh, pathogenetic factors. So the last slide, the pathophysiology of the hepatic and visceral steatosis is complex and heterogeneous. Every individual with hepatic steatosis may have a unique biological derangement. That was my key statement. So every individual has a different pathogenesis of fatty liver and NASH. Understanding the lifestyle, behavior, and genetics of each patient is a uh, foundation of alleviating of the steatosis. Lifestyle intervention is the backbone of NAPL and NASH treatment. Pharmacotherapy would be individualized based upon the behavior metabolic, genetic, aggressiveness of the disease and stage of NAPLT and NASH. And that's end my dictation, oh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahid, for a nice and uh, elaborated uh, talk on the pathophysiology of metabolic syndrome, which is a future pandemic. Uh, now we have uh, Professor Altaf with us. Uh, with, uh, with us. 
uh, we want some uh, concluding remarks from him professor uh, thank you thank you daud um, uh, are there any questions let's first answer the questions and if they are while we are waiting for questions um, a uh, brief comment by uh, president psh dr kashif malik who is here uh, kashif would you like to say something please assalamu alaikum thank you very much dr taf and uh, thank you very much uh, dr shahid habib it was a very nice presentation sorry i have joined a bit late but uh, i really enjoyed it and uh, i think it's 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 a um, good lesson for all of us and we should look for this metabolic syndrome in our society and along with this fatty liver disease so if there are any questions and from the audience and then we can discuss it other than that it's all over from my side sir thank you very much uh, dr numan zakir from pkli is here he's a very senior uh, hepatologist numan sir do you have any comment to make please the doctor saher has uh, uh, written a question regarding the use of apio folic acid for uh, nash this one i think she has just read in yeah. the chat a beta folic acid uh, shahid uh, oca Yes, OCA. As I mentioned, that the OCA upregulate the FXR genes. This is a nuclear receptor. So the obitocolic acid, say, uh, is a chinodeoxycolic acid. So it's a kind of a, and it has a basically is that the, because of the uh, gene, as I mentioned that, and especially with the behavior, how we live and how we eat, that that causes changes in dysbiosis. and the dysbiosis affects the uh, over bile acid uh, processing there is a the normal microbiota deconjugate uh, uh, deconjugate the uh, bile acids in the intestine and also there is a more uh, upregulation of the fxr by the microbiota so we lose that function so the obito colic acid regain that function by in enhancing that as we see that the fxr when we do that stimulate the bile acid by obitocolic acid the fxr upregulation has a dual effect uh, there are there are two types of fxr like the ileal fxr and the hepatic fxr so both have the different mechanism and different intracellular pathogenesis and uh, so they change the steatosis so if if in the absence of the fxr a down regulation it causes the steatosis and decreased utilization of the fatty acids by the muscles so by changing or upregulating the fxr nuclear receptors of beta folic acid it changes the uh, the more utilization towards the end point so there is a more excretion of fat in the bile there is a more utilization of the fat by the muscles and more thermogenesis that lead to the disposition of excessive amount of fat so that's where the mechanism of a vertical acid is one one more question is there any role of n acetyl cysteine in nash uh no it has been studied previously long long ago but there is no uh uh scientific role of n acetyl cysteine in nash thank you uh now i'll request professor afta for the uh, concluding remarks we have short of time also thank you very much uh, uh, thank you daud uh, thank you shahid for um, a, an excellent talk really elaborating the pathophysiological mechanism of um, uh, nafold and nash uh, one has to also remember that in our region uh, southeast asia uh, the usual western criteria for bmi and obesity do not hold true so uh, we are we have to be more careful which we are not so uh, bmi of more than 25 uh, is uh, is bad for us uh, obesity 1 and more than 30 is obese 2 so you know 
uh, we are more vulnerable uh, to this problem. Uh, basically, uh, when we talk of drugs, there are no approved drugs yet. There are a few recommended drugs. These are different, but no approved drugs, uh, obitocolic acid um, or other drug. Uh, a peep are alpha, um, uh, a peep are alpha and gamma agonist, uh, saroglitazar, is approved in India for diabetic dyslipidemia and associated NASH. So diabetic dyslipidemia, it was used in diabetic dyslipidemia for a long time. But uh, last year, it was approved in India only for use in diabetic dyslipidemia and NASH. So we don't have any drugs. And that is why the importance of this talk that uh, it is diet and lifestyle, diet and lifestyle, and diet and lifestyle only. So we have to keep on emphasizing this. Uh, there are no drugs. Uh, Obitocolic acid should be used with caution. Uh, uh, it is still off-label, and uh, you have to be careful about that. With that, I ex I'm extremely grateful to uh, Shahid. We also have Farooq Khan. He's also among the faculty. We'll listen to him next time. Uh, so over to uh, Kiran to uh, conclude the session for concluding remarks, and then uh, uh, Uzair uh, to close the session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, we are grateful and thankful to the spokes and our expert and Pakistan Society of Hepatology and of course our team at Parsa Eco Pakistan. Uh, we hope that this collaboration with PSH will produce more informative sessions for you in the future. Uh, and we will sign off for today. Uh, Allah Hafiz. Uh, Uzair, you can please call off the meeting. Uh, sure, ma'am. I'm going to call off this meeting. Allah Hafiz to all of you. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.